Good evening, you're watching SG News, I'm Hugh Riches. In tonight's show, a new exhibition in Hull showing off the works of J.M.W. Turner and Hull Fair gets underwear, underway. And I'm joined by Leah Nietzsche, our executive producer here at SG TV. Hull Fair starts today. The eight-day event runs until next Saturday, and this year will be the first time armed police will be present. The public are also being reminded that the event is a no-drinking fair and that alcohol can't be consumed on park or ride services. It's the 724th year of the fair, with thousands of people expected to attend each day. The official opening ceremony took place a little while ago, with the Lord Mayor of Kingston-upon-Hull and Admiral of the Humber, John Hewer, declaring the fair open. Police have released an image of a man they're looking for in relation to criminal damage in Cottingham. The incident happened at Sewell Petrol Station in the village in June. Anyone who knows the man is asked to contact Humberside Police. Meanwhile, the force is also appealing to find a van driver and a witness to a collision between a van and a cyclist in the East Riding. The incident happened as the cyclist rode past the Muse Junction of the A1035 on Tuesday evening. He suffered serious injuries in the collision. The van driver stopped at the scene but failed to provide details. He then drove off in the direction of White Cross Roundabout. Work by one of the UK's most famous and most brilliant artists, J.M.W. Turner, goes on display in Hull this weekend. The Turner and the Whale exhibition ties in Hull's own whaling collections to four pieces by the 18th and 19th century artist. The pieces are on loan from Tate Britain's National Collection. The whaling ones, which are three of the, the four we've borrowed, are, are quite key because they're very late works by Turner. The his style changed and started to become a little bit more abstract and wasn't so popular at the time, but it tied into what we wanted to do, which was complement the Turner Prize over the road, because Turner himself was very contemporary and challenging in his day, which is why the Turner Prize is called the Turner Prize. Uh, so it was sort of, we work as a service, so we've balanced this, and hopefully there'll be slightly different people wanting to visit the Turner Prize to this, but we hope that both sets will go to both sites, and, and that, uh, and especially that residents of Hull and the region come and enjoy this, this great artwork on their doorstep. It's an ambitious exhibition we wanted to conclude our programme this year for. We we're aiming high and want to raise the profile of the Maritime Museum before we embark on a refurbishment. Uh, and so we aimed as high as we could and we were fortunate that the Tate was so generous. Now, I'm very glad to say I'm joined by Leonici, the executive producer here at Estri TV, the person who keeps, literally keeps the show on the road. <laughs> Leah, welcome. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for staying late. No, it's lovely to be here and be on the set. Uh, we'll have, you've got a good selection of newspapers here. We have a bit of a, a police-themed start to the, okay. to the stories here. The first is about the fair, which I mentioned uh, just at the top of the programme there, helping you enjoy the fun of the fair. The police are being quite... Uh, instructional, aren't they? They are, but unfortunately, it's uh, currently the way of the world at the moment. And as uh, as we have, uh, you know, sort of critical levels of uh, of activity, you know, around the country, then um, the police need to make sure that uh, that large public events were protected. Uh, well, there are various things they're saying. The first is uh, that well, there's a nice quotation here from uh, Police Inspector Scott Snowden will have extra officers on patrol. That's so we can ensure as best as possible that anyone who comes to the fair intent on disrupting a family-oriented event, or orientated event, he said, I'm afraid, will be robustly policed. Oh, I mean, I know they're obviously they're, they're um, being very strong on um, whether you can drink alcohol or not and making sure that, um, you know, uh, the, the fair, you know, families want to enjoy themselves as well. And um, and so there is a balance to be had, isn't, isn't there? So we, we don't want to see lots of people being marched off uh, from the fair as they're enjoying themselves. But there are levels of enjoying yourself but that perhaps are appropriate at certain times. Well, that phrase robustly police has a sinister ring to it because you might be shot. Uh, they will be for the first time. <laughs> they will be for the first time armed officers. Yeah, I'm uh, not sure whether the fair, available to police the fair. I'm not sure whether robustly dealt with would be uh, maybe lethally dealt with if you were going to be shot, but maybe not robustly. Um, I, I would hope that they would talk to you before they actually decided to take aim. What about this no booze rule? That seems like sort of, you know, it's a very strange puritanical rule to apply to a fair. Just because a few people can't take their drink doesn't mean to say that everybody else can't enjoy a, I know. a, a beer with their hot dogs. I know, and it, you know, it is a shame that perhaps, you know, in, a, in our British culture, 
Um, you know, we can't always guarantee that people are going to enjoy themselves responsibly with alcohol. Um, you know, maybe uh, maybe as time goes on, we'll be able to. But um, you know, the last thing you want are people that are clearly taking too much drink if you're trying to enjoy yourself. So yeah, I agree. There's got to be a balance to it, but. Um, you, you don't want people falling over and being sick if you're trying to take your children to the fair, do you? No, not particularly. But on the other <laughs> hand, you don't, you don't want to be sort of constantly mother hened by, especially by armed officers. Well, we'll talk about, yes, <laughs> a, a shot of vodka is, it takes a completely different <laughs> meaning, doesn't it? It does. It talking, does. we mustn't, <laughs> let's hope that nothing horribly goes wrong. Uh, but talking of that, there's uh, uh, further um, uh, stories about Lincolnshire police taking part in an anti-terror anti training exercise. That's right, in Skegness. Armed officers on the street in Skegness. Um, this is in the, in the Skeggy Standard. Yes, yeah. Um, you know, um, uh, going through uh, various um, training procedures. Um, you know, we all know that um, training has to take place and when training does t take place, it means people are ready should they, you know, ever have to be ready. But hopefully the, uh, you know, the only terrors that, that they'll see on uh, Skegness Beach are perhaps people that might have come from Hull Fair and go to Skegness <laughs> for a pint instead. <laughs> well, it's been a horrible <laughs> year. I mean, the anti-terrorism treatment, I mean, we've had two or three London attacks and that horrible attack mm -hmm. in Manchester. It's been a, a vile year. Uh, and I suppose we just have to accept the fact that, uh, that the armed police officers, English armed police officers, are increasingly going to be common. Yeah, it is, and it, it is horrifying. It's shocking to see, really, because it's something that, you know, we've grown up not having to see armed officers on the street. And proud of that, proud that we're not policed by, by weaponry. That's right. And um, but, you know, when you are a free country and there are other people that don't want you to be free, um, you have to take a balanced view and try and protect those freedoms. But, it, you know, in, in the, the best way possible, unfortunately, um, there are people that um, are, are willing to go out and, and kill people. And so we, we need to uh, have our, our friendly police officers to, to try and help protect us but it, it, it sadly is um, is going in the direction we don't want to. I have a friend in Spain who's an Englishman who lives out there working as a policeman and his reasoning is that since he's English and a policeman he won't carry a gun and the mm. Spanish authorities very reasonably think that's very fine reasoning and they well, don't insist that he does carry a gun as all the others do. Yeah unfortunately we don't still live in the 1950s do we? Well, but it would be lovely to think we were all Dixon of Doc Green but you know a police as I teach my son you know a police person Police man or woman is always the first person who will help you. So always see a police officer as somebody who will help you first. If you want to know the time. Yes, or if you are lost. policeman. That's right, that's right. Final police force here, and this may have some connection with this uh, development of uh, an armed force. Um, the uh, Humberside Force, and this is in the Hull Daily Mail, is uh, developing ways to try to relieve the stress that police officers endure. And it must be the, one of the world's most stressful jobs, mm. armed or not. Uh, and they're trying to bring in various provisions. Uh, this is along with the help of the Police Federation uh, to uh, you know, have access, better access to the chief constable so that he knows what's going on. Uh, and, un and identifying and understanding the sources of stress within the organization and the introduction of new advocates to support officers struggling with stress. Mm. It, you know, it's when, when you read the newspapers, you can see the type of things that police officers are having to go through. Um, at, you know, and more, more and more now that um, police officers, um, rather than being there and, and hopefully preventing um, crime, they are they are there actively. Um, you know, when crime is is happening or, or the results of crime, and you know that and, and that that causes a huge amount of stress, I'm sure. So we need to make sure that we're looking after our police there officers. There is great camaraderie in the force as well, though, isn't there? They there do, is, they you They do know, look after each other They're, they're there to in a good way. Be, because they, 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 you know, they believe that um, we have something worth protecting and that, you know. Now, Lira, I'm going to ask my, my first is of a sequence of sporting questions. OK. <laughs> do you like ice skating? I love ice skating. Well, you're lucky. You're in luck because this, the rink in Grimsby is to reopen. I know, and, and I, I'm very lucky that, um, that some friends of mine who their son has just actually got into ice hockey and really was really, really enjoying it, the first sport that he felt that he was really good at, and then suddenly they were, they were knocked with, oh, you know, the, uh, the ice rink is going to close. So it's so fantastic that everybody in the community in Grimsby has got together and for to be able to take this over, so um, long, long may they be able to do it. What sort of skater are you? Are you the sort of Canadian violent ice hockey smashing people into the floor kind of skater, or are you more the Torval and Dean tradition? <laughs> oh, I'm certainly more of the Torval and Dean. But when I I'm on, it. but when I'm on the ice, I'm sure I, I lean more. To 
odds the other way as I as I knock various people over as I float across. <laughs> as you float gracefully <laughs> That's across right. the surface. I'm the graceful one and everybody else is falling on the ice. I don't, it always works out like that. Okay. <laughs> Talking of artistic activities in Torvald Dean, this one caught my eye. Um, this is uh, the elderly hospital patients are taught ballet on the ward. Now, this is a royal ballet dancer. Uh, a lot of patients in Hull Royal, in, in uh, uh, I should emphasize it's ballet, not belly, belly dancer. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, were, could, didn't get to the uh, to the Royal Ballet performance at the New Theatre in Hull as part of the Year of Culture. And so she came and taught, the, taught them how to do it. And uh, there, as Dr. Thompson of the hospital said, research among our patients has previously indicated that they can become bored easily while in hospital. So staff on Ward 9 have been doing a lot in recent months to improve the patient experience to keep them occupied. Well, ballet lessons. You can't be that ill, I suppose, can you? Well, I don't know. The great thing about ballet is a lot of it is to do with, with strength in the core and you can do a lot of exercises while you're sitting down, lots of stretching. So, you know, uh, the f footballers have known for a very long time that ballet is a very good way of, um, really? of developing, yeah, developing your, your balance and your core. And if somebody's, uh, I would think if somebody's been ill and it affects their balance or their strength, I would think doing, do, even if you're doing a small amount of, of ballet type exercise. You sound as if you know what you're good. talking about here. Well, I don't know. I used to, I used to do ballet when I, when I was a child and... Well, Ask um, more about that after the break. Then, Leah. <laughs> That's the surprise. I'm not wearing a leotard. Join me after the break for more ballet from Leah, and Dan will bring us all the latest sports news. Welcome back. I'm still with Leah Nietzsche, our executive producer here at Estuary TV, going through a few of the newspapers after the stunning revelation that she is a ballet dancer. And I don't mean to be rude when I say that, Leah. Uh, I, I'm not a ballet dancer now. When I was a child, I did ballet. There's a distinct difference. I, it's a long time since I was a child, Hugh. OK. <laughs> I, I went to the ballet once and it was, um, it was, I was invited. I wasn't very keen. I was invited so far in advance that I could find no excuse to decline. And it was, a, it was the Kirov Ballet at the Royal Albert Hall, Swan Lake, beautiful, fantastic, hot and cold running champagne, but it's just thump, 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 thump. I know, thump. that's the really the biggest disappointment, isn't it? You don't realise that they actually have to land. <laughs> they do. <laughs> <laughs> there throw. is some gravity applying yes, here. Yes, yes. Now, uh, this is an experience I remember. It's a long time since I was at school as well, but when I was there, I did find myself having to fill in the dreaded, it was called an Ucker form. Ucker, it was, yes. Uh, about Ucker then. and PCAS. I don't remember PCAS. No, well, you were too clever for PCAS. That was for those polytechnic types like me. Oh. Uh, right -o. okay. <laughs> and there's no, f no false humility here, please. Uh, but the, the great, one of the, it's easy enough to write down, you know, how old you are and what A-levels you've got, or, or, mm. or O-levels, or GCSEs, whatever they're called now. But you don't, uh, but it's that personal statement. That's, That's the right. tough bit. That's right. And, and, you know, there's advice in the paper about what to do, because as we know, we know when you're, you know, 18, um, you know, what do you tell people about yourself? And the advice is obviously, you know, think about all of the things you've done, you know, voluntarily, um, experiences you might have had, you know, working for parents or friends. Um, so, you know, bring in, bring in a, a variety of things that you've done that you may not think are, have been particularly um, useful, but most things that you do, you know, guiding, scouting, other things like that, that will show that you're a more rounded person. And, and saying there, don't put any, any jokes in there because it tends not to work. Because academics are utterly humorless people, aren't they? As we both know very well. <laughs> I think, well, you know, I don't think they're humorless, but obviously you need to take your, your UCAS application seriously if you want to go to university. But obviously, you know, your parents can help or guardians or, your, you know, your teachers or tutors. You know, there are, there are lots of, um, of ancient people that, that you'll talk to <laughs> every day who will be able to offer you some advice and help you. And the great thing is don't tell fibs. You know, no. don't send, you know, that summer you spent restoring the Sistine Chapel or that's uh, right, that's uh, right. when you were a, a, an aide de camp to Barack Obama. That's a really bad idea. <laughs> that's so. right. And, you know, and, um, you know, just ma make sure that um, somebody spell checks it and checks the grammar. Um, oh, of course, because it would all be typed now, wouldn't it, on right, computer? We that's I did right. it with a pen on paper. Yeah, no, so make sure that's something, especially if you're going to into, to you know, any course that where communication is absolutely and utterly 
um, vital. Just see if somebody will proofread it for you. Don't leave it to the last minute. Any course where communication is not vital should, is not a proper no, university yeah, course. Yeah, that's true. That there's, true. Some, there's some very wise advice here from an expert at Warwick University. Remember the ABC rule, says the University of Warwick. Write about the activity, whatever you did, its benefit to you, and how it relates to your course. The mm. ABC. Very good advice, isn't it? So that's a good thought. I so think that's good for life, for any the, any job application, the, actually. Well, there'll be people applying coming in this year. This is the beginning of the academic year, and there'll be people thinking about their applications for next year that's right. coming up now. This, these personal statements, they do happen in job applications, though, and then you get to the interview and you talk about why you're enthusiastic and what you can offer and what their problem is that you can solve. And then there'll be some little meek person from the personnel department sitting in the corner saying, do you work well with other people? <laughs> to which... It is so tempting to say no. <laughs> I mean, the, you know, the, the, the difficulty is, is that so, there are so many people applying for jobs now and, and it is so important to make sure that what you're putting online or you're putting in your application form really just, you know, try to catch people's eye in a, in a good way. Um, but be prepared for, for any interview. I know when we're, you know, we're interviewing for Estuary TV, so often people don't even read the job description. And that's really what your employer is asking you in an interview. So make sure you always do your homework and look at the, the, the job description and get yourself some answers pre-prepared in your head. Very well. Well, I'll take that advice should I need it in <laughs> the near future, I don't want you going anywhere. Leah. Thank you. Um, but as you know very well, no, I don't work well with other people. Oh, you don't. You're awful. I'm horrible. You are truly awful. Uh, now, you found this rather splendid story uh, about children and uh, building... Dens. That's right. I can't remember the name of the school, but it looked like a fantastic activity. Um, and um, they N worked with... New Pasture Lane Primary School. Yeah, I mean, that, lo that looked like... Um, In Bridlington. Great stuff for them to do, working with a den building organisation, um, you know, to learn how to build dens that, that don't fall down. It just made me think about, firstly, our, you know, our youngsters need to be out in the fresh air more often and learning how to build things. And, um, and hopefully that will give them... Uh, Something to write in their personal statement, should they want to. Uh, well, I think if you're going to university, <laughs> den building might not be the quality they're looking for. Were you a ch an outdoor sort of child? I was, as Did you well know, Hugh. apply a little imagination to your activities? Yes, if I, I was generally a Native American or a Wild West cowboy. I bet you did not call yourself a Native American. I didn't in those days. I'm just trying to be politically correct. OK, well, I think you're allowed to do that, if you like. <laughs> Uh, and talking of the great outdoors, some of the most beautiful of that great outdoors, uh, we were covering in the last few days these new films made uh, by uh, both the Lindsay Councils, East and West, mm. uh, promoting the beauty of the Lincolnshire Wolds. Yeah, uh, um, I watched the um, one of the videos the, the other night, actually. Well, good, because we broadcast it, and it's That's good right. to know that you're watching. That's right, I was watching it on okay. Estuary, I didn't like to say. But, um, <laughs> yeah, and uh, I think, um, you know, video uh, promotion is more and more important now uh, on the internet so I think that um, you know showcasing what we've got is fantastic. And that's the point it was shown on the internet I'm sure it'll be shown in all sorts of halls and meetings and conferences mm -hmm. as well but it was getting tens of thousands of I believe the word is hits. Yes they were and and, and I think um, it's an area of outstanding natural beauty and it's um, it's not very well known in Britain that you know the, the Lincolnshire region let alone across the world so it's nice for people to see it. It deserves to be better known, but on the other hand, it's quite nice to keep it for ourselves, isn't it? It is. Try uh, not to tell too and, many and, people. And, 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 and the world especially is beautiful, but so's the coast, of course. That's right. Uh, and, and we should say, so's Yorkshire. Oh, yes, it is. Well, the, you know, the, the worlds are actually one and the same thing that just have to have a little ice age break in the middle that we call the Humber. Thank you very much, Lear. It's not a geography lesson. <laughs> uh, Hair coursing and poaching investigations. We go back to a police story, but a slightly different kind at this time round. Uh, hair coursers, of course that's illegal, have been caught with the assistance of aerial drones tracking mm -hmm. them. Uh, now, first of all, I just want to make something clear here uh, that uh, there's a, a reference here to people. Uh, uh, police also received reports of vehicles and people on private land as trespassers, potentially committing wildlife and poaching offences. Allow me the pedant to speak here, but the wildlife and poaching offences are criminal offences. Trespass is not. That is oh. a tort for which you can be sued for damages in the civil courts. Oh, it's well, not a see. crime. We, we didn't have the kind of, of, uh, of legal education that you did. No, well, mine was absolutely no use to me whatsoever, clearly. <laughs> uh, but uh, is it Big Brother? The, the drones are watching us all. Um, I don't think the drones are watching us all, just I hope they're not anyway. Um, <laughs> um, but no, you Ooh, know, watching, it's... Enjoying your ballet. <laughs> Of course, I, you know, um, I, I think there are, there, are, there are more and more offences like 
uh, hair coursing and lamping, as they seem to call it, going and shooting wildlife. Um, and I think, you know, that this is exactly the type of thing that perhaps small drones really help the police with. So if it helps the police and helps stop these yeah. horrible people killing we'll, our wildlife. We'll have to stop there. Thanks very much for coming in. And here's Dan with all the sports. Scunthorpe United host Wigan Athletic tomorrow as they aim for a return to the League One playoff places. Connor Townsend will again be missing for Graham Alexander's side, with youngster Lewis Boutroyd again expected to play on the left side of the iron defence. The game comes following their midweek checker trade trophy win over Lincolnshire rivals Grimsby Town. Meanwhile, the Mariners take the trip to Port Vale on the hunt for three points. Luke Summerfield and Nathan Clark are both doubts for the game after missing training this week, which could mean two changes are to the side that drew with Lincoln City last weekend. The sides haven't met in the league for six years. Neil Aspin takes charge of his first game at the helm of Saturday's hosts following the sacking of Michael Brown as Vale's manager. They're languishing in 22nd place in League Two, nine points behind the Mariners. And tomorrow, tomorrow is also non-league day. North Ferriby United host FC United of Manchester at the Eon Visual Media Stadium. The Villagers are adrift at the bottom of the National League North, having scored just four goals and with just five points so far this campaign. There are also home games tomorrow for Barton, Bridlington, Bottisford Town and Hall Road Rangers. And a departure from Hull FC now and utility forward Jordan Thompson has today left the club to sign for the Lee Centurions. He signed a two-year deal with the championship team that were relegated just last week. He's made over 100 appearances for the Black and Whites in three seasons, having joined from his hometown club Castleford in 2014. He scored 12 tries during his time in East Yorkshire. And that's all for the sport. Thank you, Dan. That's it for tonight. My thanks to Leah and my apologies to her that we didn't manage to cover her sausage story. She does like a sausage. If you have a news story for us, then please visit our Facebook or Twitter pages, email news at estuary.tv or phone Grimsby 01472313553 or you can write to us at Estuary TV, Nuns Corner, Laceby Road, Grimsby. Any North East Lincolnshire DN345BQ, those are the details. From all of us here, have an absolutely splendid weekend. Good evening.